And I saw Anne, and she's wearing white pants, okay? And I says, yeah, it's spring. And I thought, ah, another one of the things I like about spring. And it just uh, brings so much good stuff into our lives. And so uh, I was happy about that, and I thought we should all enjoy the happiness of spring, right? God is faithful. God brings new things into our lives. He's always at work. Whether it's summer, fall, winter, or spring, God is always at work. And that's kind of important because I saw several headlines, several newspaper headlines that said this has been a bad week for America, for the United States. And I didn't realize it, but this was something that our president said on Friday, I guess, uh, either in connection with the memorial service. You know, last Sunday they ran the Boston Marathon, right? And you know the story of all that happened. Uh, let me read to you the ABC News account uh, as they wa talked about why it was a bad week. Moment after nail-biting moment, the events shoved us through a week that felt like an unremitting series of tragedies. Deadly bombs, poison letters, a town shattered by a colossal explosion. That's Texas, right? Some of our congressmen were receiving letters that had rice in poison in it. A violent manhunt that paralyzed a major city, emptying streets of people and filling them with heavily armed police and piercing sirens. Amid the chaos came an emotional Senate gun control vote that inflamed American divisions and evoked memories of the Newtown massacre. And through it all, torrential rain pushed the Mississippi River toward flood levels. Quote, all in all, it's been a tough week, close quote, President Barack Obama said Friday night. America was rocked this week in rare and frightening ways. We are only beginning to make sense of a series of events that move so fast, so furiously, as to almost defy attempts to figure them out. Let me reread that last line. We are only beginning to make sense of a series of events that move so fast, so furiously, as to almost defy attempts to figure them out. Yes, these are the kind of weeks and kind of collision of events that leave us shaking our head and scratching our head and wondering what's going on. And as this news article said in that last line, um, it's almost defy our ability to figure out what has happened. Wow, it has been a tough week. But you know what? In today's Bible passage, it happens that it will give us reassurance about God being in expert control in this world in the midst of troubling times. Today's passage will tell us that we can believe that God is always moving events forward with a steady hand and an ever great sense of timing. We learn that even when things in life puzzle us and we don't understand, God knows exactly what is going on. And if we can trust God, then we can be like the child who sits in the back seat of the car, trusting the parents, even if they don't understand the destination or how to get there, that they will get there and they don't have to worry about the route or the traffic or anything like that. And so that's the passage that I think God has just brought us so wonderfully too. Um, you know, I jumped right in and I, I just want to take a pause right now and uh, just say there's been a lot of good things going on this week too. 
and I want to stop and praise God for that. We had the beginning of the Awana program, and we had almost 30 kids, and uh, we had wonderful, wonderful time with him, exhausting, difficult, but uh, everybody's excited about it, and we're just so glad. We're especially uh, happy for some of the people who've shown their love for God this week. Um, the Fu family were two of our main teachers in the Awana program. Uh, up here this morning, you see the entire Archangel family who's with us serving the Lord, okay? Uh, last, uh, yesterday, I should say, I had a chance to be an actor. <laughs> Not much of an actor, but an actor. I actually had makeup put on my face, okay? Um, and, and I played one of the emperor's servants and uh, holding the bowl of ink so that he can write his decree or his prayer, whatever he was going to be writing. And uh, so a bunch of us were gathered at a studio here uh, to help Brother Mark with his ministry activity. So a lot of good things happen too. And sometimes we lose sight of that. Uh, today, we're going to get a chance to serve God by ministering uh, cleanup in the church for everybody. And I know we always do that with real gusto in our English congregation. Uh, after that, we have seminar to help parents with kids uh, who have addiction issues. Uh, you know, so a lot of good things. Our worship today so uplifted me. So again, there are really, really hard and bad things going on. But at the same time, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that there's some good things going on. Now, today's passage, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 11. I give you a moment to find it in your cell phone or PDA or they don't use PDAs anyway, in your tablet. Uh, give Philip a chance to find it. I'm going to turn off this fan. Wow, it's picking up the fan. <laughs> Sounded like a hurricane. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and as we read the 11 verses of this passage, okay, to help you, I want you to be looking for what is interesting, what is puzzling, what is unusual, what is emphasized, if there's any special details, okay? Don't just come to it and mouth the words but be thinking about the passage as we read, because only as we're thinking, then God can speak to us. Um, and, and one of the good things is, when, when one of the uh, good things is when you have your Bible or anything that shows you the whole passage, then you can get more of the clues more easily. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna read and I want you to just follow along so that you could be busy thinking and analyzing. Okay, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a coat tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. Verse four, and they went away and found a coat tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the coat? And they told them what Jesus had said, and, when they let, and they let him go. And they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Verse 8, And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And verse 11, and he, meaning Jesus, entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. 
And when he had looked around at everything as it was already laid, he went to Bethany with the twelve. Now, what did you notice? What was interesting? What was puzzling? What seemed out of place? What seemed out of proportion? What uh, questions came up in your mind? Did any of you come up with anything? You don't have to tell me. Just raise your hand if you notice something that caught your attention. Yes? Yes? Just two? We'll have to keep practicing this, okay? Uh, Michael, you want to share what you saw or wondered? Yeah. And the people, when they pulled over for Jesus, they just let it go. So they believed the disciples as well, without question. Yeah. And um, also, an unwritten poll can be hard to write normally. So okay. it was exchanged for, for Jesus. Wow, you got a lot out of that certain <laughs> passage. See, and, and, and it's true. And he should have gotten that. And we all should have gotten that. Okay, but a lot of times we're reading with our eyes, but our eyes are disengaged from our brains. Okay, we don't want to do that. Arch, what do you want to share what you were wondering? Mm hmm. Okay, so Jesus seemed to know what was supposed to happen, and uh, you also like the idea or focus on the idea of the unridden, untrained coat. Okay, and that's thinking. That's thinking beyond what's on there. Because it just says a coat that no one's ridden on, and then you guys came up with the next deduction, which is, well then, will this coat know how to handle a rider? You see? And so you saw the problem, and this is what we want to do. Um, and, and see, a lot of times people come to this passage and they really miss the main point. And we do that very easily. I call this message the red carpet, okay? And, um, you know, we, we today, especially living in L.A., we're very familiar with the red carpets. That's the usual view of this passage. A lot of your Bibles, if you have your Bible with you, if there is a heading, like on mine, it says just before verse 1, the triumphal entry. Okay? And uh, a lot of you may have heard of this as the title for sermons to do with this passage. And uh, part of it is that this is in connection with this day. It was Sunday as Jesus rode in. And because of it being Sunday, they called it something pertaining to Sunday. They talked about the branches that were being waved, and they were palm branches. And so nowadays, on the Christian calendar, the Sunday before Easter is what? Palm Sunday. You see, so we've got that very much fixed in our heads. Triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. And while that's helpful, sometimes these expectations obscure us from seeing more, seeing what is there. Is this correct? Yes, but mostly no. And I want to show you why it's mostly no, even though we do admit that this is some sort of a triumphal entry. And let me just kind of give it away. If it was really a triumphal entry, what kind of animal would Jesus come riding in on? Yeah, a war horse, a stallion, okay? He's riding on this little donkey, and, you know, probably his feet is trailing in the dust, getting all dirty and scratched, and he'd have to pull it up when he came to the rocks and stuff like that. And it's not going to look very triumphal. Back in those days, after a conquest, the ruler would come riding in, and he would be on a white stallion, and then the crowds would cheer 
with their palm branches. He would have behind him captives from the wars, and he would have behind him all the treasures that they had recovered or stolen. And so this is not quite like it. And you know that this is really not about a triumphal entry. What is the big giveaway? What is the biggest clue we have in this passage? Anybody want to make a guess? Okay, take a look at verse 11. Look at verse 11, and what is this? How does this tell us that this was not the idea that God wanted us to get, that this is a triumphal entry? It was treated as a triumphal entry by the crowds. But what happens here? When you get into the city and you go to the center of the city, the most important part of the city, what should Jesus have done? Give a speech? Yeah, that's what politicians do. What would Jesus do in addition to a speech? Maybe some miracle, right? There should be something spectacular, a real climax. This is anything but a climax. He shows up, and if he was Chinese, you know, he'd inspect the place, look up and down. Then he walks out. And you're thinking, what? You sports fans, right? The Lakers are playing. I'm wearing, I can't be there to see the game. I can't even watch it on TV. But at least I got my Laker colors on, all right? Kind of purple lines in there. Go tight. Uh, What do we say? The Lakers are going into this first game with what? Momentum. Right? They've been winning. They've been winning without Kobe. Jesus takes all this momentum from this parade, and what does he do with it? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, he just kind of tosses it out the window. Somehow it all evaporates. And so the whole thing becomes an anti-climax. And Michael and Arch saw that really perhaps realizing out of these 11 verses, how many verses are devoted to the donkey story? Seven verses. And Michael is really scratching his head because he says, Jesus is telling those guys to commit grand theft donkey. (laughs) Right? What's going on? See, these are the questions that should be coming up to us as we read this passage. And we don't get sidetracked into what the people are saying, the triumphal entry. Okay, we just had the Oscars. Now, How many people would have ever expected that as important as the Oscar ceremony is, there is another part of that whole night that may be becoming even more important? The red carpet. The red carpet. You know how this whole thing got started? It was a drop-off. The limousine's supposed to pull up and you get into the auditorium and find your assigned seat, right? And then afterwards, the pickup. Now, everybody gets to be a winner. If I dress the right dress and I borrow the right jewelry, even if I don't even have a film, even if I'm not nominated, oh, I can be full of glitz and glamour. The red carpet has taken a whole life of its own. And the morning afterwards, I notice they spend more time showing you pictures of people walking the red carpet than they did of the whole Academy Awards. If you were to ask somebody who was a part of the Academy, what would they say? 
If you were to ask the people who actually made the movies, what would they say? They says, wait a minute, we got it all wrong. It's what happened before the red carpet and after the red carpet that's most important. And the real actors will tell you, hey, even if I didn't win the award, you know, it's a craft, it's the skill, it's the work, it's the dedication, all of that, the before and the after. That's what's really, really important. But the stars put up with all the nonsense of the red carpet because it's good advertising, <laughs> okay? So, but see, the problem is the focus on the red carpet. And that's what's happened over here. They all joined in this route because they were coming for the Passover and it was a week long uh, time and they had just heard that this fellow had raised his friend from the dead after four days. And so they wanted to get a look at this guy. So just like the people who caused the red carpet today, these people were behaving in exactly the same way. They were getting a chance to see him. Um, but for Jesus, what is the before? It was his three years of doing what? Preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom, right? and discipling his leaders. And what is it that's going to be more important than the triumphal entry for Jesus afterwards? It's going to be what? The death of Christ on the cross that makes our salvation possible. The before and the after that is what is crucial. And so that's why when they get to this temple, Jesus has probably already sent everybody away. And because we're so focused on the triumphal entry and all the yelling and stuff like that, and most of the sermons are about that, and then it usually ends up with, oh, and these same people who were cheering for Jesus six days, five days later, are what? Calling for his crucifixion. What a fickle bunch. And then the question is, are we fickle as Christians? Okay, that's usually how it goes. But here are two more lessons that I think God really wanted us to get. First one is this, that Jesus, when he allowed himself and planned to come in on this donkey, was sending out a message. Up to now, what has Jesus been saying when the demon says, you are the son of God? What did he tell him to do? Shh, shut up, be gone, right? And some of the people whom he healed when they said, oh, you are the Christ, he would also tell them, hey, go home. Don't make a big deal out of it. Three years he's been keeping this whole thing a secret because he wanted them to listen to his message about the kingdom that he's bringing and about the kind of Messiah that he really wanted to be. That this time he was not going to come and be a political conqueror. This time he was not going to come and rule on the planet Earth. This time he would come as a suffering servant Messiah. He will come again, and that time when he comes, he will come to set up his kingdom on earth. That time he will take over political rulership. But this first time, he did not want their expectations and their hopes and their desires to overcome what he wanted them to understand about his first coming. And so he comes in and he allows himself for the first time to be acknowledged publicly. And he received their um, shouts to him, their cheers. 
Zechariah 9.9. He wanted them to know that he was the fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Sing aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. Okay? Or 2 Kings 9.13. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Yehu is king. And so after 36 years of keeping it private, for the first time, Jesus allows the public acknowledgement of who he was. That he is the Messiah, yes. The anticipated Messiah, yes. But the type of Messiah he was to be is very different from what they were expecting. And that's why when Mark presents this, you read these 11 verses over, and he doesn't even mention the palm branches. Okay? And uh, so he uses this horse to say, yes, Messiah, but no, not the kind that you are thinking of. And this is consistent, right? Because what's Jesus been teaching them for the last three chapters? That he's got to die. That's his main message. And the theme verse in chapter 10, verse 45, I came what? Not to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. And so this is right in line with what he's been trying to do. And so he tries to help the people to get the message. This New Year's Day, I decided I've got these Chinese, uh, these uh, students, ESL-type students from China. And I decided, you know, they've seen all the monuments and they've traveled, but they should really see the Rose Parade. So I got a bunch of them, and I took them to the Rose Parade. And we were having a good time. And after, you know, the Rose Parade, right? What's it all about? The rose, well, <laughs> the flowers and the roses, but it's about the floats, right? You got the floats, then after the floats, you got the bands, and after the bands, you got the horses, the equestrian units, right? Well, so these had come by. And then we saw a group of high school kids dressed in white coveralls, okay? And they were following the horses. And they were just walking, and it didn't look like they were walking in a straight line or anything. But they did have a purpose and a direction. You know what their purpose and direction was? Yeah, they had to pick up the manure <laughs> left over by the equestrian units because you could not have the band marching into all of that stuff, right? And when they came by, we saw them with their rolling garbage can and with their shovel and with their broom. You know what the crowd did? We gave a great cheer. And we laughed with them, and they came over, and they high-fived us. You know, they were every bit as spectacularly received as any of the floats or the bands. You know, what happens is this. You've got two essential components, two equally necessary halves of the Rose Parade. You have the spectacle part, the floats, the band, the equestrian unit, but you got the service half. The kids who pick up after the horses, the many tow trucks that you gotta have when those floats break down. And, and where the part of the Rose Parade I'm at, by then, you got about a 15% breakdown rate, okay? <laughs> um, and, and you've got all the service personnel who are riding around in their right, uh, white suits on their little schoolers, coordinating everything. 
And without this component, this component cannot function. And you need it long before you saw this component, this component at work. And so when Jesus comes in, he wants to let them know, I am coming as Messiah, but first as a service Messiah, first as the Messiah who will give his life as a ransom. And so this is the first thing we need to see and understand when Jesus presented his version of salvation and what he had to do as the leader for us that he was coming to serve, he was coming to give, and that his version had to be done his way. The second thing we need to see in this passage is another thing that we already talked about, this donkey. Now, even these seven verses could have been summarized in one or two verses. Jesus told them to go get a donkey, and then he rode the donkey, right? All this instructing in detail, first town you come to, right as you enter, and there's going to be this animal, and this animal is going to be tied, and this donkey has never, uh, coat has never been ridden upon, and this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to just go get it. Don't ask, just go get it. But if anybody stops you and asks, this is what you, he gives them all kinds of details. And then what happens in the passage that usually drives me crazy is then they repeated all that detail because the guys did it and it happened just the same way. Now, back in those days, you know, there was no printing press and paper wasn't cheap. They didn't print on paper. And I'm thinking, why all this effort? And what we're seeing here is that we know from this that God knows and controls in detail. That he will tell us that he knows what's supposed to happen every little bit. And if we follow it, we go through it, and it will work out just as he has said. And that's equally important for us. It is equally important for us to realize that God is in control. We started off the message talking about a bad week for the United States. But you know what? It hasn't been just a bad week for the United States. I know for many of you, that it's been a bad week for you personally, okay? You're going through various issues in your life. Uh, for some of you, your bad week will start maybe next week. And we think, wow, things aren't going the way I would have wanted. Things are not going the way I would have liked. Is God there? Is he watching has he got things under control? And the answer is what? Yes, he does. He is. If you've been waiting for dreams and they have been, you know, just not fulfilled, God hasn't abandoned you, but he's got his own way. We have a church family not part of this congregation. And they're over in Taiwan. And suddenly, they have a life-threatening health issue. And their lives are thrown into chaos. They need to know they will be helped by remembering that the God who instructed his disciples about the coat and how to get the coat and how to respond to the coat, the God who is in control, is with them in Taiwan as much as he was with these people. The other thing we need to know is this. We like our salvation the way we like it. Just like those people in Jerusalem, they wanted a political Messiah 
And, you know, they would settle for nothing less. Right? We like to be in control, even of things we can't control. And so now, Christians make the same mistake. Jesus came and he says, this is the way. The way I am, as you see me, this is the way your life is to be. Most Christians, they wish that heaven on earth would happen now. No problems, no struggles, no difficulties, right? Jesus says, first time around, I'm going through all this. And it makes us strong. It changes us. It disciples us. It teaches us patience. It teaches us love. It teaches us forgiveness. And we want to move immediately to heaven where we're not ever going to have to learn these things by practicing these things. And God says, no, you've got to go through this discipleship phase of life, that I will lead you through all of this. We want everything to be perfect now. And it's not to be perfect now. And there will be disappointments, and there will be hurts. But God is using these things to shape us. And so if you've had a bad week, or if you're going to have a bad week, or maybe you've had a bad year, or you're about to have a bad year, remember, God is there. And God is using it. Because this is the phase of us going through the same kind of thing that Jesus went through. And this is the only way we can be transformed. No pain, no gain. And so that's the way it is. Sorry, I didn't make it up. God made it up. Okay? But we can trust him. And you know what? Someday, someday, we are just like those Rose Parade volunteers. They rise through the ranks. They start off by picking up the manure. They start off by doing the surface things. Eventually, they move up to riding on the scooters, and then perhaps they serve on the planning committee, and perhaps they get to the point where they get to be riding with the president of the Parade Association. Well, that's not good enough. It's more like the Laker Championship Parade, where everybody be, is able to get onto the bus, because that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes again. Right now, we're the cleanup crew, but when Jesus comes again, we're going to be riding with him on the victory bus. It's got to be in these two parts. This is the order, because we need it for us to be transformed. We never gain anything. We never learn anything by having it the easy way. Hate to say that, but that's life. That's reality. That's the way it is with cooking, that's the way it is with academics. That's the way it is with our job. And you know, the more we work at it, the more we stick at it, stick with it, the more we turn it into skill and we turn it into art. It's taken me 50 years almost of being a Christian and practicing worship Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to be able to walk into any worship service, any kind of a church, and I've been in black churches, Mexican churches, Navajo churches, all Chinese-speaking churches in languages I didn't understand, and still be able to learn to worship in my spirit. You see? So all of the things when we want to get good at, if they are worth getting good at, we got to work at it. And it's going to take effort. It's going to take struggle. It's going to take suffering. But God is in control, and he'll bring you there, and he'll make it a good completion. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for your special lesson to the disciples. 
Thank you for showing us how the people didn't get it, but you wanted them to get it. You tried so hard to help them to get it. Help us that we will gain both lessons, to know that you are in control, to know that salvation, your kingdom, we have to follow your way, your schedule, your order. Lord, that might take a lot of faith. We'd love to have it easy. We'd love to have it just given to us. Have something like magic. But again, then we will have no part in making it happen. And ultimately, then, it just will feel like a cheap award. So, Lord, may your spirit speak to us and make us willing. In the meantime, help us to see the good things so that we will be sustained. Help us to see that always there are expressions of spring. There are blessings to sustain us. Thank you again for your word. Impress on our hearts your lessons through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.